In September 2001, we were in London uh, for vacation for a week and a half or so. We had a drag flight, so I really didn't carry on anything. I had a little satchel, but it might have had some brochures of things to visit. Didn't want to carry things through the airport and thought it would be a lot easier that way. The plane made a big turn, and Cheryl said something to me, we're turning, you know, and I'm like, ah, pfft. But then the pilot came on the intercom and said, due to terrorist activities, we are diverting to Canada. And I thought, well, what's going on in Cincinnati? You know, because we had a direct flight. I couldn't imagine anything. And I couldn't imagine anything going on in Cincinnati. Passengers were a little worried. Maybe it was something to do with our plane. And then the pilot came back on and announced to us that there were bombings or attacks going on yeah. in the United States. He kind of said, I, I can't really tell you because it's all rumors. And then he proceeded to tell us the all rumors. the rumors. <laughs> Once we landed, you know, I did see an American uh, Air Force jet at the airport, which I kind of thought was a bad sign. But we really didn't know. We stayed on the plane, and according to my watch, for 30 hours. Hmm. I kind of thought we were just landing and we'd get off. But they kind of told us, we don't know what to do with you, so you're going to stay here. <laughs> they did show uh, lots of movies. I think the plane erupted when they tried to show Shrek for the fifth time. Um, but they did open a door to the outside so you could kind of go up there and stick your head out. The rest of the time, uh, I don't know, it was kind of a big blur because you don't really know what's going on. You can't go anywhere and just kind of hoping things are all right. I remember sitting on the plane and uh, people trying to use the air phone. Back in the day, you had the air phones, and they were trying to call out, and you kept hearing the beep, beep, the busy signal, like the circuits were down, no one could get a call anywhere. A lot of people, if they had cell phones, didn't have international service or Canadian service, so nobody got out, nobody could get information from anywhere else. One of the reasons they, we couldn't get off was they didn't know where we were gonna go. Uh, they finally told us the school bus drivers were on strike, but they had all agreed to come back. The Red Cross was their Salvation Army. Um, when we got off the plane, they searched everything that you brought with you. I just had a purse. You might have had a little bag, but they searched everything because they really didn't know who was on the plane, if it was other terrorists or anything. So they searched us. We finally got in. We're these agencies gave us food right away, sandwiches. They started a process where we signed our names, uh, gave background information, and then they took all these thousands of people and they found places for them. And they took part of our plane. Um, they said, we're gonna go uh, to Gambo to a church and that's where we're gonna take you. So that was a pretty, pretty amazing process that they had set up by the time we got off the plane. You could see people going to the airport too. At first I thought they were just circling to kind of see what was going mm -hmm. on, but a lot of people were coming and picking up people, strangers, just to take them to their homes. So that was pretty amazing to see. We had at least a school bus full of people that uh, slept or stayed at the St. George Anglican Church. Um, stayed. We, People slept between the pews, and we also slept on a stage, like an elevated stage area, where mattresses were right next to each other. Yeah, that's funny. We got some pictures, and it seems like the whole town had donated different sheets and blankets and stuff, because, you know, nothing really matched, but there's all different kinds of stuff there. And I do remember one night I was trying to sleep, and apparently I was snoring keeping the whole church awake. <laughs> People were tossing tissues at me <laughs> to try and wake me up softly. It worked. <laughs> the mattresses were right next to each other. You kind of had to sometimes walk on some of them to get around because we're all on the stage there. And then in the community areas where we ate and where the church, all the church parishioners um, came in and fixed us food every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, they were pretty amazing. It really didn't dawn on me until I saw moose on the table. <laughs> I had a math teacher who used to rave about moose steaks, and I used to make fun of him. <laughs> They're the best eaten in the world, he said. And when I saw it there, I thought, man, these people are getting into their own pantries and bringing stuff to feed us. 
It's not like they can go to Kroger's and buy stuff. They were, yeah, that's... it was all, it really changed me for the better. One thing I did learn when I was there was uh, some geography, ge because I had no idea where Newfoundland was. I'm like, they said you're in Gander, Newfoundland. I go, oh, I've heard of Gander because flights used to land there because going across the ocean. People are talking about, let's rent a car, let's just go home, we can get there. And someone brought a map out at the church and they go, here we are. And I'm like, oh. And you had to go like six or eight hours to get to the ferry, then the ferry was six hours and then <laughs> it would take forever to get home if you could find a rental car and you could not find a rental car anywhere. For the longest time, we had no idea what was going on. The first time we learned that anything happened on September 11th was when we got to the church where we were taken in Gambo. They had someone wire up cable to the church that never had cable before, but they got the cable in so that we could see what happened. And on that TV is where we saw the planes hit the towers. So that was the first time we knew. That was Two like Wednesday, yeah. after Wednesday evening. Mm -hmm. Another thing the church did for us is they got a phone line in and we all could make long distance phone calls because I never talked to anyone until got to the church and was able to call home. That was amazing. When they said they were gonna hook up the cable, you know, like my experience is I rolled my eyes, like <laughs> I'll be home by that time. <laughs> and you know, and later that day they were there hooking up the cable and the same with the an extra phone line. They said, oh, we got an extra phone line. You know, again, you roll your eyes and sure enough, they show up and hook up an extra phone line. And I remember standing in line to call my dad and I was probably in line 40 minutes. I finally get to the front. Uh, I forgot his number. <laughs> <laughs> we left London on Tuesday. We finally got off the plane Wednesday. So we spent Wednesday night there, Thursday night there. And because we were one of the last ones to land, we were one of the first ones to leave. So I think we left Friday afternoon and made it home to Cincinnati Friday, late Friday evening. They told us that we would be leaving that day and um, they came, they pulled up the bus to in front of the church. They called out flight 37 and you hear this, yeah, this big <laughs> cheer and everyone's, yay, you know, thanking everybody, but we're so happy. And there's that one picture of the people in the bus and everyone's smiling because we're finally going home. And we were the first ones to get to the airport and buy all the souvenirs. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank all the people there in Gander, in Gambo, all the agencies, the Red Cross, Salvation Army, everyone that helped us uh, while these horrible things were going on in the United States. I'll just be forever grateful. And like I said, it changed me for the better. I do think that we would come together for others that landed in our airport or our country. I know I would. <laughs> I didn't think I would ever say that. I'm not that kind of person, but now <laughs> I am.